You're listening to the Struck Podcast. I'm Dan Blewett. I'm Alan Hall. And here on Struck, we talk about everything aviation, aerospace engineering, and lightning protection. All right, welcome back to the Struck Podcast. On today's episode, we're going to chat a little bit about airlines and some of the kind of unique, quirky ways they're trying to still make a, a dollar and stay afloat. Um, merch is one way of describing it. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Boeing. Unfortunately, I uh, have announced that they're going to make some more job cuts. Also, a interesting sighting, an F-117 was spotted in San Diego, which is a supposedly retired uh, jet. And we're going to chat a little bit about some interesting photographs uh, a NASA spacecraft took recently of sprites and elves, which are to unique types of lightning. So we'll, uh, we'll, or at least the way lightning is sort of displayed in the atmosphere. In our engineering segment, we'll talk about pilots remaining calm, which we've chatted about in the past, uh, and also about this new uh, PEC material from Hexel that's electrically conductive. So pretty interesting, expensive new technology. And then lastly, in our electric tech segment, we're going to talk about a new partnership between Japan Airlines and Volocopter, which I still think is Alan's favorite EVTOL, and a quick talk about Jaunt. So Alan, let's go to the airlines first. So in this interesting article by Aerotime.Aero, they're just talking about some of these airlines are, are just hustling, essentially. So they're, some are selling in-flight meals to yeah. people on the ground. Yeah. Um, you know, some of their snacks, uh, bar carts, like accessories, stuff like that. For, and this seems to be more the like the luxury airlines like Finnair and some other ones. Sure. But Alan, would you would you buy a in-flight meal <laughs> on uh, on the ground? Well, I don't know if I'd buy a meal necessarily. Uh, maybe if they offered it in like at a place of work that instead of having a cafeteria, there were just these little box meals, then yeah, I think it would make a lot of sense because the cafeterias are probably shut down. So having a box meal would be a, a nice little uptick in, in, uh, in the benefits package. But the I think the one that is curious is all the all the nuts and the especially the the more expensive nuts that you get on some of the nicer flights like they need to unload those things somewhere and it, it's coming near the mm-hmm. holidays and that's where that I think the, the the funny thing is that it's like getting close to in the states Thanksgiving and then Christmas which are big nut holidays and uh, little trinkety holiday items I, I, they could do a mm-hmm. decent market don't you think like. I think it'd be a funny gag gift. Like, yeah. hey, since we didn't get to do anything fun at all this entire year, and it was the worst year on record, here's some Southwest peanuts. Like, ha, ha, ha. I think that's a good joke. It's a good stocking stuffer yeah. for a quick laugh. The slippers, you know? the little eye covers, and the... They have on some of those on some of the flights, the, the, the first class benefits are pretty good still. And so all those little mm-hmm. trinkets and things would... Be a nice little, you know, something to put under the under the Christmas tree as saying, "Hey, next year we're go- we're going to go travel because COVID's over and we can go do our thing." So, yeah, it, it seems like to be a marketplace for that kind of stuff because there, there's always if, if you've ever looked online, there's some really interesting like aircraft trinkets, which is the one mm-hmm. I seen recently is where they're taking old airplanes like an Airbus 320 that went out of service and they're cutting it up into little key tags essentially. So this this piece That's cool piece of aluminum came out of a uh, B-52 or something of the sort. And so you can have a little memento of the airplane. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of aluminum in an airplane, so they can make hundreds of thousands of these little tiny squares of, of aluminum. And it's a kind of a cool thing, but I think they were like 10 bucks, like 10 bucks. I don't I don't know. I'm not sure that makes sense. That's a, that's a good business. It is a yeah, great business. That makes sense. I mean, yeah. for Etsy, Etsy or something, like if you had an Etsy shop and you're good with, you know, like any jewelry designer could just say, hey, I'm going to buy, you know, a, a chunk of a plane and then you get it home, then you cut it up into smaller pieces and you make some little, you know, make it into a dog tag or jewelry and just sell it at a nice markup. Yeah. That's actually a smart business idea. So if you're going to steal that from me, uh, <laughs> at least give me a credit. But well, one of the, the really, I think this one's the, probably the most fun thing in the article is that it says Qantas Airways sold a thousand stocked bar carts from their old now retired Boeing 747 fleet. Stocked? So you can have one of those carts that you, that you wheel down the, uh, the aisle. At your house, that's amazing. <laughs> you know, if you have a, a nice roomy home, you could just wheel it out. Like, who wants ginger ale? Would you like the whole can or just, uh, you know, like that's 
awesome and that would be such a fun gift for like someone you know who's got a little money who's got like everything you know like oh especially for someone who's got their own pr private plane or a little you know pilot like that's an awesome christmas oh, gift it's, if person. you have a pool no I, we don't have a pool we haven't had a pool in oh you're right right that's a good just set the right. wheel around that's the pool take. and offer people drinks it's like the perfect mm -hmm. <laughs> perfect for florida awful for massachusetts but yeah <laughs> Yeah, good take there. So moving on, Boeing is unfortunately said they're going to lay off maybe another 7,000 workers. So we mentioned Boeing a lot. Alan, what's uh, what's your, your thought here? They're trying to pair costs down. And I don't, I, it's, you have the 787 all moving to, to South Carolina. You have a lot of the 737 not really ramped up quite yet. And the 777 sort of on the next generation is 777 on a basically a delay you got people that you don't don't have any place for right now so uh they're looking to slim down not huge amounts because there's about 130 140 thousand employees within in boeing and i wonder if some of them are going to be sort of that middle management tier rather than the mm -hmm. people on the floor uh but it's still not good we got to get over this uh yeah it's we gotta get we gotta get covid covid well, we would all love to get over well, COVID. yeah I, I, yeah we, right but here's the thing about covid which is very frustrating for me which is everybody's back at school everybody's back at school on some level all elementary schools almost everywhere in the united states uh sc schools are in session colleges are definitely in session in session they're actually playing sports uh, which we didn't yeah. think was possible. So we haven't seen huge number shifts in sort of COVID for large populations in which there should be big, bigger problems. And I think what we're seeing in the United States is that sort of that 20 to 30 year old bracket is where the trouble lies in terms of, of being contagious to one another. Just, it's just youth. I think more people not thinking you're invincible. That's which is what you do when you're 20. Right. So you, don't pay as much attention to things. And I think that's where the outbreak lies. But for for the vast majority of society, it has been relatively low, so to speak. It's all relative, obviously. But if we're all in panic mode all the time and being in an election season, there are specific, specific candidates that are trying to put everybody into panic mode because it drives votes, then the consequences of that are airlines suffer because everybody's scared to travel. Even though the data right now points to it not being really a risk, you're probably more at risk going to the local Walmart, Target, grocery store than you are being on an airline flight. That's probably the logistics of it and the truth of the matter, but it doesn't feel like that. And so until we feel some sort of normalcy, airlines are going to be in trouble, which means that Boeing is going to continue to lay off people. Airbus is going to be the same boat, Embraer, Bombardier, uh, Textron, Dassault, and the only people that's only companies that seem to be stable are Gulfstream uh, on the larger jets because there's sort of uh, only a couple of people traveling those things. That's just not good for the industry. Just not good. So citing in San Diego some F-117s, which were supposedly retired in 2008, and now we know the F-117 was reactivated, so they sent a couple of them to the Middle East in 2017. Okay. But they were recently seen again. So these are the first gen, right? So they're over 25 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, people have gotten no explanation from the government. They're not really sure what are the F-17s doing. Uh, <laughs> Alan, got any uh, hypotheses? I do that. I think the administration in the United States looks at it a little bit differently than probably the military did four or five years ago. And there is a reluctance to, just because the, in the United States they're bringing online F-22s and F-35s, which have stealth E capabilities. I'm not sure they're as stealthy as the F-117, but so be it. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about that online. But the I think the administration is saying, hey, look, the cost of an F-35, the loss of one of those is a way more, and the loss of the technology is probably more important than the loss of the airframe itself. And they have uh, lost a couple of F-117s in, in flights. So uh, I think one was down in Yugoslavia years ago, if I remember correctly. But the the issue with the F-117 is like, it's still a viable airplane. And for the vast majority of the world, 
they're never going to be able to detect it. So if you're in places of the world like Syria, which is in turmoil, you can probably fly an F-117. If you lost it, it's not going to be a national security issue, so to speak, uh, mm -hmm. because the technology gotcha. is older, right? So it, it does make sense unless you're having some large invasion that maybe the F-117 is your proper airplane for that mission. The, the issue really comes about is like, who's going to fly that thing? Because you have to have... Yeah. You have to fly it, right? I mean, you have to be competent at flying it. It's not the easiest aircraft in the world to fly, from what I hear. So you you want to fly it and keep yourself up to date on it, which is where some with the camera in today's world sees an F-117, especially in San Diego, with a lot of military personnel who know what that aircraft is uh, are, are going to be able to spot it and take a picture of it. So I'm not surprised it's still flying around. I think that makes a lot of sense, actually. I'd be surprised if it wasn't flying. Gotcha. Well, it did, they did say that they're in Type 1000 storage, which means that they could be reactivated for for duty at like any moment. Sure. So everything you said, I think, adds up, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So moving on to, to NASA. So NASA's Juno spacecraft discovered that uh, in Jupiter's atmosphere, they have these lightning-like electrical outbursts that we call sprites or elves. Mm -hmm. So... I'm just going to move right to you. Alan, what are elves? What are sprites? <laughs> and tell us about what NASA has found. On planet, just because there's, if you think about the atmosphere of any planet, there's gases in that atmosphere. And in, 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 the, in the world, our planet, uh, Earth, there's a lot of nitrogen. And I think on Jupiter, wasn't it hydrogen? But if there's electrical activity, if you think about a thunderstorm cloud as being this big pocket of charge, and so you're, you're generating electricity in the air because of friction. That's essentially how it happens. You get ice crystals mm -hmm. from frozen water, and then they rub against one another, and they start to get polarized, and then you get these huge uh, pockets of charge. When they discharge, and there's a lightning strike, and we on the ground say, wow, there's a lightning strike. But that electricity also goes to the upper atmosphere, too. So it's going up and down to neutralize, so to speak, the electricity in the atmosphere. So until probably the late 80s, early 90s, we didn't know a lot about it. There was, I think there were just some recordings of people, see, especially if you're in the United States in the Midwest and you're looking west when a thunderstorm's coming towards you, because of the curvature of the earth, you can actually see the, the sprites and the, and the elves appearing way up in the sky. And it wasn't until recently where we started to record them and understand what, what it meant. But essentially sprites are electrical discharges that look vertical. And then elves are these uh, sort of circular patterns that happen in the upper atmosphere, the, the kind of glowing discharge sort of events. It's, they're unusual, but they're just electrical. I think of it just about electric charge moving up through the atmosphere. It's sort of, it's not like the Aurora Borealis, but it kind of has the same sort of effect as the Aurora Borealis. Those are two different effects, but uh, the you know, the sprites and the, and the elves are caused by charge in clouds and the same thing exists in other planets but the thing about uh the the little nasa uh data experiment was that they saw flashes in data but they didn't know what it was it didn't appear like they knew what it was and then they went back through several years of data and went oh look there's electricity electricity discharges up into the upper atmosphere that's what's happening. Wow, that's just like Earth. Mm -hmm. So we're planet-wise, I think the, the, the funny thing about it is planet-wise, a lot of things that happen on Jupiter, being a much larger planet, also happen on Earth. They're, the atmospheres are very similar. Although, although they may contain different relative gases, the effects are very similar between the two in terms of electricity in the atmosphere, which is really cool, really, really cool. All right, so in our engineering segment today, first thing we're going to talk a little bit about systems and training, which uh, may be a form of engineering, probably not the strictest sense, but we're talking about uh, pilot training, how do pilots re uh, remain calm in extreme situations, and we chatted about this a uh, number of episodes, maybe like 10, 10 or 15 ago, uh, as we were talking about checklists and how important those are for just making correct decisions when under duress. Um, and so this article also from aerotime.aero, they just talk about a couple of different uh, bullet points, but one that I really want to besides, so here, here are the main ones, uh, strict selection process. Obviously you need to be cut from maybe the right cloth to be like, not everyone's capable of making sensible decisions under, 
under pressure, uh, scope of training, repetition, you know, clear directives and procedures. But the last one here is taking a break. And they talk about not making impulsive decisions. And even when under stress, taking a moment to really assess the situation, which just might be a, a second or two just to pause and actually think. And I think it's a really interesting concept that even when in like a really pressure situation and, you know, obviously the one that comes to mind is the, uh, the miracle on the Hudson, right. With mm -hmm. the famous pilot now Sully. Um, but Alan, tell us about making a, a pause before a really critical time sensitive decision. I think it all has to do with just slowing your brain down and being able to process the information. That seems to be the key. And the for pilots, I think a lot of it is just habit. And I've been reading that or listening to the audio book uh, called Habit. And I forget the gentleman's name who wrote it, but it basically breaks down how your brain processes information. And they studied mice and uh, monkeys and apes and all kinds of creatures trying to figure out how your brain processes information and how you sort of sort through things and what becomes habit and what doesn't become habit. And pilots are creatures of habit that there are they have know what's coming next and that's sort of an important part to know what's coming next and to take those really key elements of of data and to be able to process it to to have the right response right because you're in the control loop the pilots are in the control loop so the more you repeat these emergency procedures the more they become automatic in your head you don't have to really think about them because it's actually stored in a different part of your brain now, that is fascinating because you always think, oh, I know there's short-term memory and there's long-term memory, but physically, it's actually changing the location in your brain so that you don't even really think about a lot of things. A lot of things you do on a regular basis, like make yourself a cup of coffee or get out of bed or um, pull out of a parking lot are such, they're complicated tasks when you break them down, but you do them with such ease and you don't even really think about it. If you ask yourself, how did I make that cup of coffee 10 minutes ago? People have forgotten they've already made it, but they physically did it because it becomes such a habit. And pilots can train like that. If you listen to pilot talk sometime, that they're, they're, that those checklist items that they bang through and the, 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 the emergency procedures that they go through and the checklist that they have are part of building that habit so they know what the next point is. And it, it's a basically like slowing it down, right? It's a, it's a slowing down effect. All right, so Hexel, is a composites company. They make a lot of really in interesting, innovative materials. Article here from compositesworld.com. They're talking about Hexpec. So Hex, P-E-K-K. -K. Uh, so it's a type of uh, obviously plastic material. Mm -hmm. And they say with this Hexel Hexpec, it is a electrically conductive material. It's uh, got fi carbon fiber in it. Mm -hmm. And it's going to meet static electricity management standards that um you know some customers are looking for in the aerospace industry and others but mm -hmm. alan this seems like it's a pretty darn expensive material yes. and <laughs> tell us a little bit about about hexpec and its applications well you see more and more 3d applications printing applications for aircraft parts uh, because the shapes are unique and sometimes you need a funky looking part to do the job and it's hard to injection mold a piece of plastic the, the, the molds themselves can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars so if you can print it, it, it the, the cost benefit, if you're, you're printing low quantities or making low quantities, it's a lot cheaper to print it, especially if it's an experimental part. Mm -hmm. It's easier to do. And then the question comes down to materials, right? What material are you going to print the, the plastic from? There's been a lot of nylon materials, and you still see a lot of nylon today. And then there's nylon with carbon fiber, which provides a little stiffer material. It's a little easier to work with. Uh, but as soon as you start adding carbon fiber to anything, price goes up. And then when you start playing around with aerospace grade plastics like PEC and Ultim and the, the, the things that are the plastics that are used inside a cabin of an aircraft because they don't really burn all that well, they don't smoke, uh, the price shoots up even more. So uh, taking a, a PEC material and putting carbon fiber with it probably has tremendous, from what I can tell online, it has tremendous properties and they can make some really cool parts out of it it's but the cost is going to be very expensive so your, your application market is going to be aerospace because uh you can get you can get value out of that still because it's going to save you so much money on and then injection molding of parts and I, yeah i see it a lot 
more recently on interior parts because there's a lot of plastic clips and little things that you don't think about but mm -hmm. there's a lot of variable variations on plastic clips and brackets and whatnot that you wouldn't necessarily want to make in mass production if you're only making 50 airplanes a year that you could probably 3d print i think the question about 3d printing still is it's mechanical um, resiliency because it essentially layers the plastic that are laid down and squirted out of a nozzle so to speak so it's like mm -hmm. so you're mm -hmm. kind of squirting this stuff out and it's hot so you got a hot nozzle and I, I one of the issues when you load any plastic with um we saw this on another project when you load any plastic with some sort of material like carbon fiber carbon fiber is rough and so it tends to just eat up equipment <laughs> it's so, so just but anytime you're laying down a, a melted plastic how mechanically strong is that you don't have any way of knowing, so to speak, versus injection molded park where you know the plastic is at a certain temperature all the time and you know that it crystallized properly in an injection molding situation. You're not so sure of that when you 3D print. So it becomes a little bit of the 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 quality of the part, the consistency of the part. And there's ways to overcome all those things, obviously. But mm -hmm. that's where the, the contention lies. And uh, as we get better and better plastics and become more and more capable of printing out parts, you're going to see more of it, and more in particular in interiors. And you see more of an in interiors. You're, I, you're not going to see, from what I can tell, you're not going to see like a 3D printed aileron or a 3D printed wing. That's not where we're going with this right now. It's too early in the development. But a little plastic clip for a coat hanger or a baggage compartment or some part of a lavatory, absolutely, they're going to do that. Yeah, and so for for this version specifically. You know the electrically conductive PEC, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's a PEC-based carbon fiber. Mm -hmm. What's what's that application with in aerospace? Like, what are they going to make out of that? You said it's really expensive, but yep. is that something for like radome parts, wing parts? Mm -hmm. Like, where do you see that being applied? So, putting carbon fiber gives it additional strength, and it kind of cross-links everything together, so you have additional strength. But it has this conductivity part of it, which they're trying to promote. The conductivity part would come into play if you're moving. Uh, fluids, like if you're moving fuel around, there's electrical charge that can be built up in fuel as you pump it somewhere. And so you'd like to be able to dissipate the charge that sits in the fuel. Uh, so having conductive parts okay. or resistive parts could dissipate the charge. Same thing in like air conditioner ducts in, in the overheads. You know, we're talking about air move, traveling in airplanes and how they duck the airplanes. But there's essentially these fiberglass channels that sit above the baggage compartments where the air blows, they can build up static charge because as soon as you start running air through them, uh, the fiberglass can build up charge and you can have problems with that. So having an anti-static uh, feed line tube, it can dissipate the static charge that would otherwise be there. So there are places where the conductivity comes into play to make the product overall better. The, the one area which I think they're implying that they can have some use is on the RF side. Can it be quote unquote quasi stealthy? Maybe there's a lot about stealth that is complicated and having something that's sort of resistive, sort of conductive, it's kind of in that middle band. It kind of, it probably has some stealthy components to it based on what shape you make out of it. So you could make some stealthy pieces out of it, but again, stealth is complicated and there's no magic solution to stealth. Uh, so it means complicated shapes, kind of complicated uh, conductivity ranges, usually layers of, of conductivity, to absorb, reflect, whatever they're going to do. So the, the, having another material in the arsenal is always helpful. I just don't know if it's going to be the whiz-bang thing that it's sort of being advertised right now. All right, so for our final segment, we're going to talk about EVTOLs real quick. So Japan Airlines has invested into EVTOL development and their choice here is also Alan's choice, uh, Volocopter, which is a German company. So Volocopter looks like a little, you know, uh, looks like a helicopter. You think it's probably the most, one of the most viable designs. You're a fan. It seems safe, right? It's got, it's not really ducting around it. Is it ducting or is it just, just like a, a propeller guard? More just like a guard. Yeah, guards. Yeah. Call, and structure. It's got yeah. this mm -hmm. kind of yeah. hexagon structure. It's got a nice like lattice work. Yeah. It reminds me of like an elk, like almost like a yes like antlers yes. the way it kind of just protects everything but uh yeah. so japan airlines is interested in this project just to supply remote islands and mountains obviously the the little island has a lot of 
just interesting topography in general. Mm -hmm. So they probably see that as a pretty viable, you know, a lot of viable little routes to otherwise remote in inaccessible areas. So yeah. what do you think about this this partnership, Alan? I, I think it's great. Volocopter has been looking for applications. Like we talked about a couple of episodes ago where Volocopter mm -hmm. was going to be in the Olympics in Paris in 2024. That makes a lot of sense to me because you just want to move people from A to B. But I, I think one of their big key markets is is uh, helicopter replacement services. So for, for emergency transport of uh, wounded people or, or moving a you know a heart transplant from from one hospital to another this volocopter makes a lot of sense and if the distances aren't that far but the terrain is bad and you couldn't put a runway in you're only talking about vertical takeoff and landings it's either a helicopter or a volocopter volocopter makes a lot of sense because it's gonna be a lot less expensive to operate which is where like ampere in hawaii is going to greatly reduce fuel costs because they can shuttle people on an electric propeller driven system for about you know 30 percent of the cost it would be on an in internal combustion engine thing so the the technology is right and if you can lower the operational costs there's a huge benefit to volocopter if the distances aren't too far because volocopter doesn't go that far but japan is mm -hmm. pretty co-located the if you look at the islands around it they're pretty close to shore so there's not a huge distances to travel there and it could be a really good fit for them. And so, you know, hats off, right? I think that makes a lot of sense. A lot of sense. Yeah, agree. So last article for today, uh, aviationtoday.com has a interesting title. How does Jaunt Air Mobility plan to achieve type certification for EVCOL systems? And in this article, and we've talked about Jaunt uh, at least once, maybe twice on the show thus far, yeah. they have a little infographic that shows sort of their timeline and uh, 2023, and this is my question to you, Alan. So on 2023, journey pre-production first flight, and then certification begins mm -hmm. in 2023, yeah. and then 2025, low rate production begins, and then 2026, certification and full rate production. So could they get certified in three years with their... No, uh, not three, six, 2026, right? They're going to start... 2023. We're going to start in 2023. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you'll have an aircraft. So six years from now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Six years from now. Right. That's probably the most realistic schedule I've heard in a long time. Yes. It's going to take them that long. Uh, just because of the complexities of the flight test program and all the the certification issues that need to be resolved. The, 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 the FAA requirements, the new Part 23 requirements, which are going to be leveled mostly on these things. So there's a new, the FAA issued in 2017 or 2018, it's been a couple of years ago now, they issued new requirements for smaller aircraft that uh, simplify the requirements or condense the requirements. They won't so much prescriptive saying you have to do it this way. They, they, they just set performance requirements there. It has to be able to do X, make it do X. We don't care how you do X, just make it do X. That's mm -hmm. So it's a different style of certification and and which is good i mean it, it does open the door to a lot more technology and and design changes that are more adaptable to what's actually going on right now the the issue really is and what john was talking about or was trying to get across is is that you don't want to spend a bunch of money building test articles flight test articles and equipment unless you can show that the safety, you meet the safety requirements, that the design as on paper starts checking all the FAA boxes. And I, and that's a very valid approach, right? Because you, you've seen some of these aircraft companies, little aircraft companies pop up with a really cool design, but you know that the path to certification is be very difficult because of the way it's constructed. And that's why you see these sort of iterative designs happen where they start off with a really cool looking little project and then it evolves into a, something that looks a little safer and then it evolves again into something that's a little bit bigger and probably a little bit safer. So they're, they're, they're having to spend money to learn the certification approach versus doing the certification approach first, getting it down on paper and then building it. And I think that's where Jaunt was trying to go because the, the Jaunt is an outgrowth of Carter and Carter was a, I want to say gyrocopter. I'm going to get killed for this, but it's essentially a gyrocopter. So it's got a rotating, low rotating speed 
blade on top and mm-hmm. it's got a propeller on the back, right? So the the design is uh, a rotating wing sort of design. There's a lot of moving parts there and there's some advantages. There's some just very uh, good advantages to it from a design standpoint, but, 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 safety, 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 the FAA is gonna run you through the safety gauntlet and ch- make you check all these boxes that it does all the safety stuff. So it may be a, a great aerodynamic performer, but if it's not uh, meeting the FAA safety requirements, then what's the point? Which is what John's saying is that, hey, look, we need a, we, not, we, we don't need to spend $100 million a year on a design that's not going anywhere. We need to figure out what the requirements are, which they have to work with the FAA on a special condition, it sounds like. And once they get that defined, then they can start spending money because i think from an investor standpoint you really want to know what the ground rules are before you start pouring in a bunch of money because if you don't know what the ground rules are to the game do you want to play the game and i think that's the faa is setting the setting the rules so to speak so we're going to play this game there's going to be 500 million dollars on the table but i don't know what the rules are that doesn't sound like a wise game to me. I want to know what the rules are, and then I'll decide if I want to put $500 million into it. That's the way John's trying to approach it. It's a smart, it's a really smart approach. All right, well, that'll do it for today's episode of Struck. If you're new to the show, thank you so much for listening, and please leave a review and subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Check out the WeatherGuard Lightning Tech YouTube channel for video episodes, full interviews, and short clips from the show. And follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Our handle is at WG Lightning. Tune in next Tuesday for another great episode on aviation, aerospace engineering, and lightning protection. Strike Tape, WeatherGuard Lightning Tech's proprietary lightning protection for radomes, provides unmatched durability for years to come. If you need help with your radome lightning protection, reach out to us at weatherguardaero.com. That's weatherguardaero.com.